to everyone. I know that uh, nothing that anyone will say will offer comfort to the Dockers fans, but I'll have a go. The Bible verse that has come to mind is Psalm 30, uh, verses 10 to verse 12. Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I give you thanks forever. That particular truth regarding the way God uh, turns our mourning into um, dancing is a, a very important truth. My very first congregation that I went to was in Bowen. Um, a new congregation came about as a result, uh, not of mission planning as such, but came about as a result of a death of one of the members of the congregation. Uh, and they, they asked me to do the funeral, and I said, um, it was a Tongan funeral, and I didn't want to do the Tongan funeral because they go on for days, 10 days. <clears throat> and there are services morning, lunch at night. And I said to them, look, I know other Tongan ministers in Brisbane. I would be more than happy to bring them up and to do uh, the funeral. And they said, no, no, we want you to do it. And I said, okay, I'll do the funeral. After that funeral... There was such, uh, there was joy within the community that we all felt God calling us to start a new congregation. And from that day forth, a new congregation has uh, grew, and it still goes today, and it's larger than the congregation that I was called to minister to. So simply to say that uh, God works in mysterious ways. He does uh, turn uh, what we... Believe our bad situations, he can bring new life uh, uh, as a result of that. So I hope that's some comfort, Andrew, to a little bit. No? no? Okay, a little bit. <laughs> the importance of language, I would like to talk about. The importance of language for maintaining our faith. And I also want to talk about the importance of boundaries. Our family came to Australia in 1977, I think as I've mentioned. My father's first placement was in Esperance. Just before we went to Esperance, we, we came to Perth. And on our arrival in Perth, everything was new for us. It was just so exciting. I was only a little kid. But everything was just so big uh, compared to what we were used to uh, on the islands. The reality, uh, however, adjusting to a new culture and a new way of life hit me when I first started a primary school at Esperance Primary School, began school in grade two. I was so afraid and so scared of being left alone in a classroom with all these uh, bailangi or white kids that my mother needed to stay with me in the classroom. When she would try and leave, I would cry and hold very tight onto her arms. The headmaster told her just to leave me behind and go. He will get over it. And uh, after a week, on the Friday, my mother did go. And as you can imagine, I was not a very happy boy. Cried and bawled my eyes out, and I'm still scarred uh, from that particular incident. <clears throat> but after a while, as I began to mix and play with the other kids, I did discover that these balangi or these white kids were not so bad after all. Actually, my mother told me later on that some, oh, there was a rumour going around, or some had thought that I was the son of the Prime Minister of Tonga. So I had a bit of a wow factor in school, and probably why I became a little bit popular. But when they found out that I was just the son of a mini star, I lost my X, X factor in school. The principal of the school at the time, Mr. Ian Palmer, very good friends of ours, who was a member of our congregation in Esperance, encouraged my parents to speak to me and my sister, my sister and I, in English, all the time, even at home, so that we could learn the English language much faster and much quicker. 
And of course, uh, this proved to be a very helpful strategy. However, after 13, 13 years living in Western Australia, my sister and I lost, totally lost, the ability to speak Tongan altogether. We could understand um, some of the things my parents uh, would say, particularly when they told us off. But we did lose our ability to speak in Tongan. And so the point that stands out for me here is the importance of language for preserving not only our own culture, not only for preserving our own identity, but knowing language, understanding our language is important for preserving, maintaining our faith. I lost the ability to speak Tongan in WA, so it's very hard to maintain our culture. When we left Western Australia, we moved to Sydney, where my father was called, as I mentioned before, to be part of a Tongan congregation. Everything was in Tongan. The youth group was in Tongan. So I found it very, very hard to feel part or to be involved in any uh, conversation. So it was a clash of cultures once again, but in a different way. But language was so important to me that I went back to Tonga in 1996 to teach at one of the, of the colleges there. But the main reason for me going back was to learn the language, to understand the culture, to re-establish my identity as a, as a Tongan person. Simply want to say that as Christians, I think we all need to be bilingual. We need to know the gospel well. Uh, Leslie Newbigin says we shouldn't just learn the language like a tourist learns a language of a, of a new culture. We need to know the language well. We need to indwell the language of the gospel. At the same time, we also need the ability to speak the language of our society or the culture in which we live. Theologian by the name of Ford, I'm not sure his first name, wrote a book on being a theologian of the cross. He says, we must avoid, he argues, um, the serious erosion or slippage in the language of theology. That is when we constantly work under the assumption that our language must constantly be trimmed so that we do not offend anyone in our politically correct society, then our language, says Ford, will gradually decline to the level of greeting card sentimentality. Language will then lose its theological legitimacy and therefore its viability and effectiveness in terms of communicating the truth of the gospel. When we were here in Western Australia, I had grown up to be a Balangi or a Westerner in a sense, and in many ways this reality happened very quickly. I wasn't very aware that I had become kind of a different person in a new culture. Though of course there were very specific times where we were reminded exactly of the boundary of what we cannot do in Australia as Tongan people. One example is regarding backchatting to your parents. Respecting your parents and your elders is essential in our culture and forms a part of our identity regarding what it means to be a Tongan. We call it hanga whakatonga literally means behavior like a Tongan. When my sister and I backchatted to our parents, we were reminded very quickly, verbally and sometimes enforced physically, i.e. with the wooden spoon, that backchatting is a no-no. My mum would tell us off and say, stop being anga whakapalangi, behaving like an European. But of course, my sister and I got into this white man's habit ourselves as kids, which always landed us in serious trouble, but somehow we kept doing it. Romans 7, 5, 15 may shed light on this problem. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want 
but I do the very thing I hate. That's my excuse and I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> In Tongan culture, there are specific behaviours which are associated with being Tongan. Anga fakatonga. There are also very specific behaviours which we associate with being a Christian. Anga fakalotu, or the Christian way. Those behaviours which we believe are not good, inappropriate or disgusting, we often use the term anga fakamanu, behaviour like animals. Because there is a very strong connection and interwovenness between the gospel and the Tongan culture, we like to think that there is a direct relationship between anga fakatonga, our Tongan way, and anga fakalotu, or the Christian way. For example, our national motto as Tongan people is expressed in our Tongan coat of arms, and it says, which means God and Tonga are my heritage or my inheritance. That is at the heart of a Tongan's identity is the knowledge and the understanding that God and Tonga together form and shape our identity as people. Both must go hand in hand. That is to be Anga Fakalotu, to behave like a Christian, and Anga Fakatonga, to behave like a Tonga, needs to go together. For my parents, therefore, when we behaved in ways that were not in accordance with their understanding of what it means to be Anga Fakatonga, we were very quickly disciplined. Here is a reflection that my sister wrote that appeared in our Synod magazine, our Journey magazine. And this is part of her own personal reflection, life growing up in Australia, while still trying to maintain our identity. And she says, Growing up as a Tongan in an Australian culture has not always been easy. There were often times of disagreement and stress between my parents and myself as to how I should live my life. I was often confronted with the difficult decision of deciding between my parents' traditional Tongan expectations and the new, more liberal way of understanding and doing things in the Australian culture. Many of my decisions, she says, often led to the wooden spoon and a slap on the face for backchatting, something which my parents back then referred to as balangi or anglo, things that will not be tolerated in the house. Growing up as a Christian and as a TPK, a Tongan pastor's kid, <laughs> meant that we had to uphold very, a very strict code of moral behaviour, which was very hard, particularly when all our friends seemed to live a much more independent and freer lifestyle. Reflecting, however, on the past and the struggles that I went through, I am very proud to say that I am grateful to God for the parents that he gave me and the often difficult experiences that I went through because it provided me with the inner social resources and skills and ability and the passion to be able to live as a Christian in the world, but not of the world, upholding the values and the teachings of Jesus Christ in an obedient and humble way, with love and best wishes to all who are struggling to live as Christians in the world. In the current multicultural and plural society that we live in, the church's unique identity and mission in Jesus Christ often becomes blurred or lost in the name of religious pluralism. Or, as Newbegin points out, truth simply disappears into the undifferentiated ocean of information. It is therefore imperative, he says, that the church re-establish the boundary of the church in terms of what is inside from what is outside. The function of the boundary, says Lauren Mead, missiologist, 
The function of the boundary is not to exclude people, but rather to try and help the community of faith to strengthen its identity and its commitment to serving the world. That is, the purpose of the boundary is not to separate the church from the world, but rather to establish the church's own authenticity and distinctiveness so that it can live visibly in its faith in a way that is shaped by the biblical tradition and not in a way that reflects our society as such. As the community of faith grows in its understanding of its identity and its uniqueness in Christ, it is then enabled to reach out more beyond its boundaries. Dr. John Haver, a Tongan theologian, argues that the reward of getting up close to a boundary or a barrier is to realise that a boundary does not close up space, but it is the space through which inside and outside interflow or interpenetrate. That is, a boundary separates, but it also links inside and outside. The integrity of the boundary, says Lauren Mead, is to help the community in its continuing effort to discern not only the church's mission, but to help define the role and purpose of each individual member within the wider body of the church. It is about becoming clear about the cultural differences between those who follow the values of the world and those who follow the values of the gospel. We are powerless, says Mead. We are powerless to change ourselves and the world if we are confused about what our community stands for. We therefore must build congregations where people know and follow Jesus, not simply the latest polls, he says. I understand very well that there is a fear in postmodern culture that the language of boundaries promotes division rather than encouraging unity. The fear is, of course, justified in some circles, particularly because of the way some have misused boundaries to exclude and oppress others, particularly the vulnerable and the poor in our society. In fear of marginalising one person or one group, postmodernism or pluralism says that it is better not to have clear or well-defined boundaries. In the past, the Uniting Church leadership used to like saying that it is better to live in the messy middle rather than having clear boundaries. However, the flaw in this argument is that if we do not have clear boundaries, then we have no place from which to make ethical and political judgments. No borders or boundaries, the transgression of which constitutes oppression. And we will have no ability to discern between the cry of the oppressed and the arrogant exclamations of the powerful. Not only that, but another theologian says, boundaries are constitutive to identity. And unless we can draw a line or a boundary and say something lies outside its domain, then we can speak about nothing that lies inside with any deep meaning. Boundaries give definition, identity and protection for individuals, institutions such as churches, nations and so on and on. A boundary gives us something to which we can point and ascribe a name. 
Without a boundary, we have nothing to which we can invite and welcome anyone else. Without boundaries, there can be no sense of place as home, as a site of hospitality, security, and intimacy with local knowledge. Without boundaries, there is no locality and therefore no sense of membership in a particular uh, community, family, or neighbourhood, which has an identity in distinction from other communities, other families, other neighbourhoods. Without boundaries, identity is impossible. Lewis, another theologian, speaking about the, the theology of the cross, supports this by saying that boundaries create identity and a, and, and a sense of belonging. The division that boundaries mark, whether visible with a wall or invisible, such as lines on the map, creates entities on either sides. The boundary not only separates these two entities, but they also simultaneously relate the two entities to one another. For example, suburbs, states, countries are what they are by virtue of their borders, which keep them apart, yet at the same time make them adjacent. Though boundaries can become points of tension, and they do, Though boundaries can become points of argument, and it does. It is also the place where two entities can meet and look both ways. It is by looking in both ways, in both directions, that you are enabled to secure a bilateral perspective from which to judge between varying arguments and perhaps a balancing point or axis upon which to affirm them both. As we reflect on this understanding, Lewis, who wrote a book between cross and resurrection, a theology of Holy Saturday, he argues that we are able to get some idea of what it means to stand in between the boundary between Good Friday and Easter Day by standing on the Saturday. Where better, says this particular theologian, than Easter Saturday, than the Easter Saturday grave, to stand and see with clarity the humiliation and crucifixion of Jesus on the Friday as well as his victorious and glorious resurrection and exhortation on the Sunday. It is on this boundary, that of the Holy Saturday grave, that Lewis argues that we are able to find the understanding and the wisdom necessary to unite these two seemingly contradictory poles, the cross and the resurrection. It is at this boundary, he says, that we are able to discover the truth about the foolishness of the cross. The cross as boundary not only separates the church from the world, but at the same time it joins the two entities into one reality, which is the reality of Jesus Christ. That is, as Lewis continues to say, the church, to be sure, is dissimilar and different as wholly other from the world as is the holy God who chooses, calls and sanctifies it. Yet the people of God, just like God's own self, can only be wholly other by being holy for, manifesting and giving substance to their holiness by their very acts of Easter Saturday solidarity and identification with the world. It is the cross of Christ, I believe, that is the necessary boundary that all churches in all cultures must look to for the necessary critique 
of its understanding and practice of ministry in the world. It is the cross that allows the church to live within, as Leslie Newbegin puts it, live within the magnetic field set up between the amazing grace of God and the appalling sin of the world. It is the cross that will help the church to live within the reality of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Newbegin says, All true thinking about this, as about every matter, must be held within the magnetic field set up between these two poles, the amazing grace of God and the appalling sin of the world. To live in this magnetic field is to live in an atmosphere which is charged with power, tingling, as it were, with electricity. One is always, in the humanly speaking, impossible position of knowing that one is, along with all others, at the same time, the enemy of God, as well as a beloved child of God. To live in this charged field of force is always at the same time supremely demanding and supremely affirming. We must always, sorry, we must not be tempted to slacken this tension by drawing away from one or the other of these two poles. A church in a postmodern society cannot fall into this temptation which is so strong to slacken this tension between the amazing grace of God and the appalling sin of the world. The cross as boundary draws an imaginary line between the church and the world, separating them as two separate entities, but also simultaneously relates the two entities uh, to one another. The purpose of the boundaries, as I've said, is not to keep the two entities apart, but rather to relate the two entities together. The purpose of the cross of Jesus Christ is to help the church become clearer about its own unique identity in Jesus Christ as its Lord and the Lord of the world. Not so that it might isolate itself from the world, but so that it might better serve the world to which Christ died for and its salvation. May God continue to help us as we understand, seek to understand further what it means to be the church in mission, reaching out uh, to the world.